This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. very much. It's quite an honor to be here presenting some of the work that was funded through the Tools and Technology Program of CIRM. I'm going to talk about a new imaging modality you probably haven't heard of called magnetic particle imaging. We've built all seven of the scanners in North America in my laboratory. I wanted to start with the most important slide, which is just showing the people who've done all the work I'm about to show. Um, in particular, I wanted to highlight Patrick Goodwill, a, an incredible former grad student of mine who is also a research associate now in my group, and he is a, a force of nature in getting this technology off the ground. I collaborate with um, physicians at, at Stanford and also with David Schaefer, who's a world-known uh, stem cell biologist at UC Berkeley. My goal of my group is to engineer improved medical imaging systems in very close collaboration with MDs and scientists. Okay, so what I'd like to do today is cover why would we want to track stem cells in vivo, um, and then compare the new technology we're developing, magnetic particle imaging, for that application to current methods that people use, uh, notably MRI and other methods. And then I also wanted to highlight one application that I consider to have been sort of a seed funding application, and that is cardiovascular imaging for patients who have chronic kidney disease. And I couldn't have an NIH grant without the seed funding from CIRM uh, to get that technology up and running. Okay, I think everyone here is aware of the fact that, of the tremendous potential of stem cell therapies for uh, mitigating organ um, failures and things like shown here from this uh, nature paper on cardiac disease. We need to get cells, stem cells, into the affected organ. We, want, we have to create a niche where they can survive. And of course, we want them to improve the function of that organ, and then we want them to stay stably and improve that uh, function of that affected organ, say in heart failure, uh, for months and years and years to go. So the role of imaging is to actually see this in vivo. Usually we start off, of course, in small animals, but then it would be wonderful if we could then do that in individual patients to make sure that we can figure out how those cells are improving the function and of those cells. You can imagine that once you inject cells, there's a very difficult debugging problem. Were those cells removed uh, by the liver? Were they removed by the macrophages? Were they uh, filtered out in the lungs? All these questions are very difficult to answer if you can't see through the body. And in fact, the dominant um, method that molecular and cellular biologists re rely on is optical microscopy, which gives superb submicron resolution. Um, I think you might be able to make out some of this fluorescent imaging of uh, stem cells here. Um, the problem with this is twofold. First, cell culture experiments can be enormously precise, and they can help uh, stem cell biologists quantitate what they would like to know about the biology, but they can fail to predict in vivo results because they don't model everything of the in vivo environment. There's no blood supply, there's no immune system, there's um, quite a bit different biochemistry. The challenge, though, is as we move to humans, of course, optical, trans optical light won't penetrate very deep into tissue, so we have to look at radiologic scanners, uh, things like MRI and CT that we use for human imaging. And as a scanner designer, I want to point out that tracking stem cells is a very challenging physics and engineering problem as well as a very challenging biomedical challenge. The reason is, um, Typical resolution in a small animal, typically a mouse scanner, is on the order of 100 micron resolution. If you think about even 1,000 stem cells, which sounds like a fairly large number of stem cells, that's on the order of 100 microns cubed. So it's actually um, difficult to see this. This is only one pixel in your image. 
the human brain, by comparison, has about 100 billion cells. And so we're actually trying to push the physics and contrast limits of quantitative mouse imaging. Um, you could think of this as really trying to find needles in a haystack. It's a very small number of total cells in the animal. So the ideal stem cell imager would look like this. It would be safe and non-toxic, so we could translate it to humans one day. We would want incredible sensitivity. The biologists always tell me they would like to see a single cell in vivo. We would love to have quantification of cell number. So if the cell numbers go from 100 to 50, we would like to know that. We would love to have 100 micron resolution in a small animal. Millimeter resolution would be fine in a human. We want to be able to assess whether those cells are still alive. It doesn't do as much good to have cells that are dead when they arrive at the affected organ. So we need to be able to assess that. Of course, it's wonderful if it's affordable for all the biology labs. Right now, this ideal combination doesn't exist. Let me tell you a little bit about what people rely on. Even though we don't have an ideal um, setup, we can use something called bioluminescence imaging. This is uh, formerly from Xenogen Corporation, a startup from Stanford that was based in Alameda here in the Bay Area. It gives, uh, it's used all the time by molecular and cellular biologists. One problem it has is it's um, because it's using light that's luminescing off of labeled cells, um, you get attenuation with depth. And so it's difficult to get quantitative assessments from this modality. And in addition, if you're going more than, say, a centimeter deep in the animal, you actually get blurring from the fact that you're getting diffusion of photons to the surface of the animal. Um, I'm sure many of you have had relatives who've had a computer a CT study or a CAT scan. Um, th they also design these now for small animals, mouse, because this is the prevalent model in so much of cancer biology as well as other diseases. And these give spectacular resolution. You can see this image of the spine of the mouse here and this other image here of the mouse. Um, this is not used as much in stem cell tracking um, due to uh, modest sensitivity and poor soft tissue contrast. Perhaps the dominant imaging modality currently used is magnetic resonance imaging. And again, uh, manufacturers have put out very good um, sensitive MRI scanners for this application. Here you can see the, the left ventricle of this mouse at incredible resolution. And you can see these black holes those are stem cells that have been labeled, and you can actually see them by the hole created in the image. And that's the way this particular modality um, manifests it. Problem with that is those, it's difficult to quantitate those dark holes in the image. And so when we look forward, what we would like to do is find a new imaging modality that wouldn't have some of the limitations that we have with the current modalities. Um, typically, in order to solve this needle in the haystack problem, we need to label the cells before we put them into the animal with some sort of a beacon that we can actually see very brightly in our image. And we are reusing a contrast agent developed for MRI. These are little nanoparticles of iron oxides, and they're actually the same ones used in your credit card to label your, your number. Um, they're about 30 nanometers in size. One thing that's wonderful is that these are already FDA approved, so we can actually translate this to humans right away. They're actually totally non-toxic. They're actually safer than the current contrast agents we use in human imaging. Okay, once we've labeled those stem cells um, with these particles, we can then inject them. The particles don't affect the stem cells in any way in vivo, and then we can just track those labels. The physics of this method is much more promising than when we do it with MRI because we actually get a million-fold stronger magnetization in these particles than what we do in MRI. And I should point out what we're doing is almost akin to these um, beach devices that we use for looking for metal in the beach. Okay, so in my lab, we're an instrument design lab, and over the last few years, uh, largely with CIRM tools and technology support, we've been able to build one of these mouse scanners per year. This is uh, uh, quite a bit faster and has been a lot easier than building MRI scanners. Okay, so I'm going to give a, just a loose idea of how MPI works. If you've ever tried to find a stud under drywall, it's a little bit like that. What we do is we create a sensitive point called a field-free point in the magnetic field where the B field is actually zero. And then we scan that zero point in the magnetic field electronically over the entire image. 
Whenever you cross over one of these little iron oxide tags, you actually get a very large signal induced in a receiver coil. And so it is a little bit like a stud finder. As we scan it over there, you get a very big signal when you move over the stud in the wall. In MPI, the physics is a little different from a stud finder, but here we have a C for the first letter of Cal. And you can see as we scan that field-free point through here, this is the raw signal we actually measure on our device. And then if we grid that to the location we know that field-free point is, we can actually spell out the letter C. So it's quite a bit easier than the way MRI works. And um, this is where we are today. This is one of our better images. We create something called a phantom where we actually inject the FDA-approved contrast agent Resivist into this phantom, and then this is the image we get out. As you can see, all images wind up being worse resolution than a photograph, of course, but this one we can actually image in the middle of a human or even in, in the middle of an elephant because there's absolutely no attenuation whatsoever inside of tissue. To prove that, we did this experiment. This is about a million uh, labeled stem cells in the bottom of this cuvette. And we then buried that in tissue, in a couple milliliters of tissue. And here you can, I don't know if you can make it out in this rep representation, but here you can see the black label, the iron oxide black labeled on those million cells. Here, once it's buried in tissue, you can no longer make out the black cells. And that's just a proof that what we already know is that tissue is optically opaque. However, if you look at the magnetic signature, before and after in A and B, we get exactly the same magnetic signal out of this um, without, with or without the presence of the tissue. This is great news for tracking stem cells. It does have some implications for cancer imaging because it means we don't see the native tissue in the body. All we see is the contrast agent. Okay, so we started doing some more careful experiments in collaboration with David Schaefer's group. And here we labeled some human embryonic stem cells using this protocol here, standard protocol for 20 years in the MRI field. Here we see a, a million labeled um, HESCs. Here we see all the way down to 5,000. And please note that you can't even see these with your naked eye. Um, when we actually do the correlation coefficient, this is exactly what we wanted. We want to be able to quantitate the signal we get out perfectly with the number of stem cells. And we do hit a noise floor, after which you're going to get an unreliable estimate. Right now, that noise floor um, is about 5,000 cells. We think, with a lot of engineering, we can actually get that down to five cells, which would be a, quite a breakthrough in sensitivity. Okay, so to summarize the stem cell application with MPI, we're working on a brand new imaging modality, really pioneered in our lab. The first experiments were done at Philips Corporation in Hamburg, Germany, and right now I think we're just a little bit ahead of them, um, but we're working in, in collaboration um, with all of the labs in magnetic particle imaging. There's only a few labs currently in the world working on this. It has zero depth attenuation because the magnetic fields can pass transparently through any tissue. It's, so it's truly quantitative. We are exactly counting the number of cells, or at least the number of SPIOs on those cells, and that's a very reliable indicator of the number of cells. Our sensitivity limit, I mentioned, is about 5,000 stem cells right now, and we think we can get that in the future all the way down to five cells. Part of the reason for this is we have this enormous magnetization in these labels on the order of a million times stronger than what we image routinely with MRI. So there is a weakness that I wanted to point out. It's not all perfect yet. Um, the resolution, the spatial resolution, is on the order of a millimeter currently, and this is not that good for small animals. That's perfectly fine for humans, but in a, in a mouse, that resolution is not very good. Um, and so we're collaborating with people uh, like Ken and Christian up at the University of Washington to develop n magnetic nanoparticles that are specifically targeted for this new imaging modality instead of reusing nanoparticles that were developed specifically for MRI. And we think we can actually get this down to 200 micron in the near future. And as I mentioned, we don't get an image of the native tissue, so you, for some applications like imaging cancer, it would be very helpful to know if the cancer has left the um, organ, say you're looking at liver cancer. If it's left that organ, that's important um, staging information. So for that, you would need an anatomic reference, very much like PET-CT. 
Okay, so I wanted to segue into what I, I consider the next big application for this clinically, and um, I, I consider the seed funding from CIRM to be absolutely critical to get this funding from the NIH. Um, and the real question we're trying to answer is, can magnetic particle imaging be safer than this X-ray angiogram? And this is called an X-ray angiogram. This is 55-year-old technology. And believe it or not, this is still the, one of the standards of care for um, cardiology for assessing basically obstructions in your coronary arteries. And it's just superb resolution on the order of quarter millimeter and really beautiful contrast and, of course, real-time fluoroscopic frame rate. The problem with this is it has some significant dose. In other words, we're using x-rays, which have ionizing radiation. It has a very serious contrast risk, especially for patients who have chronic kidney disease. And, it, and the way this is usually phrased is uh, significant morbidity and mortality. Okay, so what I would like to um, venture into is how could we look at replacing a significant fraction of the studies that are now done with iodine with magnetic particle imaging so we built a projection scanner, very similar to that X-ray projection scanner I just showed you fluoroscopically, and we're really targeting this population. 40% of Americans now over the age of 60 have something called chronic kidney disease. This is an affliction where they simply can't um, process all of the wastes in their body as well as normal patients, and this is a progressive disease, usually stage 3. Stage 5, you're on dialysis. Unfortunately, all of the contrast agents we now have, iodine and gadolinium, are very dangerous for patients with chronic kidney disease. And it, until five years ago, um, gadolinium was the preferred imaging contrast agent used with MRI for these patients, but a new condition called NSF, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, was discovered uh, in the last few years, and so iodine has now become the standard of care um, for most chronic kidney disease patients. And so iodine, though, has its own risk, and you can see down here that 30% uh, risk of something called co contrast-induced nephropathy, and that can triple the mortality rate after you've induced chronic contrast-induced nephropathy. So the real punchline here is that the superparamagnetic iron oxides that we use in magnetic particle imaging are actually now FDA-approved as a treatment for anemia in chronic kidney disease patients. So it's actually not just benign, you could argue it's actually uh, helpful to those patients. So we, we uh, made this image here. This is, again, a phantom image. We created a spiral, filled it up with about a third of the recommended dose of this uh, contrast agent called Resivist. And then this is not an MRI scan. This is actually a magnetic particle imaging scan from our scanner. And it, it looks somewhat fabricated, but that is real data. And you can actually see that the resolution is not the same in the radial direction as it is in the axial direction. And um, but we're very proud of this. We, we show it spinning quite a bit. The, the image quality here is, is spectacular, and we are really working hard to improve the spatial resolution of this method. And I should point out that this is already close to what we would need in a human scanner for imaging coronary arteries, because this is on the order of 1.2 millimeter resolution and with beautiful contrast. The next project we're working on, um, we're building the world's strongest uh, gradient field. As we increase the gradient, very much like MRI, we improve the resolution. So we've reached roughly the limit of what we can do with neodymium iron boride technology for the gradient strengths on the order of seven Tesla per meter. This is quite a bit stronger than MRI gradient fields. And we can get to about 1.4 uh, millimeter resolution with this. And I just wanted to show one study we did on an ex vivo rabbit kidney. Basically, what we did is we did one injection of the SPIO contrast agent into the uh, ureter here and, and then did three washes of deionized de water and imaged it like this. So you can see the, the, the placement of the, yeah, it looks a little better here. You can see the, the placement of this as it moves to the periphery of the kidney. 
Okay, so in conclusion, I just wanted to sh share some of our very early days. This is, in my opinion, very similar to the late 1970s in the field of MRI. When we were just developing it, there weren't any commercial scanners available. And the physics, the biology, the methodology, the nanoparticles, everything is still up for grabs. It's a very, very exciting area of research. Um, and we're finding out that we can do some wonderful quantitation of stem cells in mice. The MPI images are very robust, sensitive, and quantitative. There's a lot of new hardware, software, and the nanoparticles themselves that can be improved. The big, the big thing that we really want to improve the most is the resolution, the spatial resolution, especially in, in small animals. It's likely that we would have to move from permanent magnet technology to superconducting gradient technology. Um, but we don't think that that's going to be uh, that's going to scale terribly. We think the cost will be very comparable to a conventional 1.5 Tesla MRI scanner. Um, and I think that one of the closest applications outside of the stem cell arena would be angiography for patients with chronic kidney disease because the contrast agent we use is completely safe. We're not using any ionizing radiation whatsoever, um, and so this could be the, the very a much much safer way of imaging these patients. Down the road, we'd love to move into things like targeted cancer, uh, treatment following, and inflammation imaging. It's well known from the MRI literature that if you inject these uh, nanoparticles, they're covered with dextran, and they're very, very small. So they're taken up by macrophages and other inflammation cells in the body. But those inflammation cells will then go to other parts of the body. And so if you wait a day or you wait some hours, what you'll see is that you'll have an Im inflammation image in the middle uh, that what we would basically get an image of. And so there is no way to do that now very um, well. Most all of the methods with inflammation imaging either involve a nuclear tracer for, for um, um, like nuclear medicine like PET, or you'd have to rely on MRI, and, but then you're gonna get the negative contrast problem, so it's very difficult to make out the inflammation. Um, so those are the three applications we're moving forward. And I just wanted to point out some of the key collaborators that we're working on this with. David Schaefer at UC Berkeley, great stem cell biologist. Uh, Mike McConnell and Bob Hu are cardiologists I've worked with for two decades at Stanford. Uh, Kenan Krishnan is a material scientist at University of Washington who's working on developing these nanoparticle contrast agents on a, in collaboration on an NIH grant that we are working on. Uh, Patrick Goodwill is the incredible research associate who's uh, built these scanners I've shown you, and Bo Zhang has been doing the stem cell experiments I, I mentioned here today. And with that, I'd like to ask if there are any questions. Steve, Steve, you had mentioned that you were going to use a Parkinson's mouse model um, to, to track cells That's early right. on. That's right. So David David Schaefer is our collaborator on that, and he's very active in that field. We we have not yet actually um, worked on the, the Parkinson's model, but we're we're ramping up. We've just done our very very early um, stem cell experiments in in, uh, in mice. Yeah, Bert. Thanks. If you infuse label cells in a mass, can you track them? Sure. Like one of the big issues for a lot of things in pediatrics now is crossing the blood-brain barrier. Right. So do these cells get across the blood-brain barrier? Ah. This seems like the way you could really see okay. does that happen. Right. Well, the, the nanoparticles are going to get through the blood-brain barrier better than the cells, right? I understand. Okay. So, but then it's an open question. The, the nanoparticles we're using are, are they're, the, the size of the particles is about 30 nanometers in diameter. And then there's usually a dextran coating, which is another, it takes it out to about 60 nanometers total diameter. So if that can get through the blood vein barrier with, say, ultrasound or with, you know, another method of, of getting through there, then that would be wonderful. We haven't done those experiments yet. But I mean labeling a cell. Sure. Will, will a cell with the particle? If, if, this, the, if the cell goes through there, the, it will, the, it's, it's certain that those particles will remain adhered to those cells. You know, I think it's really important to point out what Steve said about all the other granting agencies here and how CERM leveraged that opportunity um, um, to generate preliminary data to be able to go to these other places. And I think that's a great example of what we do. And it would be nice to be able to track 
how many times we funded programs that were pilots that then led to other grant funding as well. Um, maybe we do that. Uh, that's not so easy to do, but I think it's a good thing to, to, to consider. We, we do include it in our progress reports. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike. Very nice, Steve. So um, the COIL in particular sort of answered one of my questions in that how well resolution can you get of, I, you know, I spent 11 years at Cal, so I, yep. like, I like seeing you spell out Cal. That's nice, <laughs> but it's a, you know, it's a flat. So I'm starting That's to right. worry about the dimensions, but the COIL shows how beautifully you can see yeah. structures. Right. So now, then how easy it is, is it for you to say where that structure is? So, right. you know, you're in a liver somewhere. Right. Where in the liver are you? Can you, right. figure, can you figure that out? Sure. Yeah. One of the great things, I worked 20 years in MRI. And in MRI, you're sensitive to outrageous levels of inhomogeneity. Even a part per thousand or, you know, part per million is actually a problem in magnetic resonance imaging. We could image with a wrench right near our scanner. It wouldn't have any effect at all, amazingly. Um, we don't, but, <laughs> but we have 10% tolerances on all magnetic fields. And, and we'll still get a very reproducible location for this, the scan. So the, but that doesn't answer fully your question. So the magnetic field gives us perfect um, location in three space, but we would then need a stereotactic guidance from That's say right. X-ray so or That or was CT. the question, so you have to use some other way to. Right, now for angiography, um, that's not as relevant, but for stem cell or for cancer, it is certainly relevant. And so we, we have already, you know, there's a, a, a small animal imaging center in the Lika Shing building, which CIRM had a very major role in funding um, at Berkeley. And so we're actually helping out with uh, getting a, a seven Tesla or hopefully a seven Tesla MRI scanner there and, and a CT scanner and an X-ray scanner by planar. And so we would use that for the anatomic reference image. So in the end, it's gonna look an awful lot like um, PET-CT. And at this stage of the game, it, it seems that very few radiation oncology departments are buying a PET scanner without a CT scanner sort of appended to it. It's very popular. I, I just a sort of a trivial question: Are you ever going to name one after a man? <laughs> um, I, I, I I'm allow my my grad students to name them. <laughs> I've heard you, you said that the resolution was sufficient to be for human testing. You That's have right. a human approved contrast agent. Yep. Or, and you've actually even highlighted a disease yep. opportunity. What do you see are the barriers to actually uh, utilizing this in people? So we have to build a human side scanner. Uh, and we have not yet done that. To When I say it's easy, or I should say straightforward to build that scanner, it is other people know how to build those superconducting magnets. I've never built one like that. Um, it is very similar. It turns out that a three Tesla MRI scanner has already a six Tesla per meter gradient at the very lip of the magnet. And so this is not pushing state of the art on the magnet. That doesn't mean there won't be some surprises when you actually put the whole thing together. Um, but I do think that we would, we probably wouldn't be doing this if we were doing, say, cardiac applications. I doubt we'd be doing that again with permanent magnets. We might have to go to superconductors. Well, thank you for a most interesting presentation. Thank you all. Thank you.